Good evening, everybody. My name is Jody. I'm an adult services associate for Addison Public Library. I'm here this evening with a long awaited program with astro educator Michelle Nichols. When I scheduled you in, Michelle, it seemed like forever away. And here we are, 11 11 on a Thursday night. Thanks, everybody, for joining us here on Zoom. It's kind of good to be back. We've been doing a lot of in-person programming and hopefully someday we will do that again with Michelle. Um, but until that time, let's sit back, relax, grab a beverage, kick your slippers off and enjoy the show. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, please feel free to ask questions in the chat, of course. Um, just a quick uh, program announcement. I'm gonna do zero waste mindset with a woman named Monica Gerritsen or Gerritsen Chavez uh, in person in the library next Monday, uh, teaching about uh, the stream of waste and how to prevent uh, more trash from accumulating as well as just uh, increasing your healthy lifestyle. So it should be actually really good. Um, looking forward to that. And without further ado, I'm just going to go off screen and I'm going to let Michelle introduce herself a little bit if she would be so kind. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself because it's always interesting. And right. then we will enjoy our our tour. By the way, that program that you just mentioned sounds perfect for the holiday season when lots and lots of trash is generated. My so, thoughts exactly. I'm yep, glad you yep. understood. So, yeah. Yes. So hope everyone can uh, take part in that one as well. But this one is on a completely different topic. Um, so my name is Michelle Nichols and I am uh, the Director of Public Observing at the Adler Planetarium. And what that means is I'm in charge of all of the Adler's telescope observing and sky observing initiatives and events and our observatory. So uh, I've been there for 26 years. My bachelor's degree is in physics and astronomy and my master's degree is in education. So I get to straddle both worlds. I get to learn all the cool stuff is what's going on in the universe. And then I get to figure out how to tell you all about it. So um, it's, it's, a, it's a fun way to, uh, to, to learn what's going on. Uh, which is the best way to learn something is to try to teach it to somebody else. So every time I do programs like this, um, it, it just, it, it's always great to get your questions because um, that helps me figure out what you're interested in and what you want to know about. So uh, as Jody said, throughout the program, if you think of a question, throw it in the chat. Um, if you want to wait till the end, that's fine. But as you think of it, just, just put it there and we will uh, get to that, like I said, at the end. So the great part, I, I think it was Marianne who, uh, who said that um, may not understand everything, but the pictures are really cool. That's kind of this program too. There's probably going to be way more information than you ever wanted to know. Uh, but I got to admit, as far as pictures go, this talk, pretty much has the, the cream of the crop in, in terms of really, really interesting, pretty pictures. So if you want to, just let it wash over. And, and um, if, but like I said, if you have a question, I'm, I'm, I welcome your questions. So give me just a second to share my screen. Always takes a few seconds to do that. And I'll get the notification that it's going. There we go. Okay. All right, we call it Armchair Tour of the Universe. I don't know if the chair that you're sitting in has arms, mine does. Um, so why don't we get started? We're gonna start from Earth and work our way out. And if you look out at a dark sky, if you're, if you're lucky enough to get away from lights and light pollution, you might see something like this. This is a picture taken in the winter time, or at least somewhere around a little, little before winter, maybe during winter. Um, how I know that is uh, from, from this particular group of stars right here. And that is the constellation Orion the Hunter. And if you take a look at that star right there and that star right there, they're, they're different colors. This star right here, stars come in different colors. Star color tells you star temperature. The redder the star, the cooler it is. The bluer the star, the hotter it is. Yes, that is different from your water faucets and your bathroom. Um, we in astronomy love confusing you. 
So, uh, but color really does tell you temperature. The, the coolest stars are red, orange. Our, our sun is kind of in the middle in terms of temperature. And the hottest stars are white, blue, white, and blue. Um, this star right here is called Betelgeuse. And this one is called Rigel. Not all the stars in the sky have cute names, um, but one thing that uh, when you look out at this picture is it, it's kind of hard to tell how far away the stars are. They all look kind of two-dimensional, but we have ways of studying how far away some of the stars are. So when we map out, for example, these stars right here, what do we see in terms of how far away they are? Are they all at the same distance from Earth? And the answer is no. Here is Betelgeuse right here. Here is Rigel right here. And you can see that if you look in three dimensions, uh, the stars that make up this constellation are all at different distances from us. So um, when we look out on uh, the, the stars that are closest to us, they may look two-dimensional in our night sky, but they really are at various distances. Um, and we're going to get to uh, what this pink, fuzzy, splotchy thing is in, in just a little bit. But one thing that was also in this picture, kind of right here, you can kind of get a sense that there might have been uh, a few extra stars in that part of the picture. And when we go out under a really dark sky, you might during the winter or the summer, look overhead and you see a distinct band of stars across the sky. That is called the Milky Way. Um, long time ago, according to, uh, is a Greek or Roman, or whichever story it was, um, it was called the Via Lactea, the, the, the spilled milk. Um, it looked like spilled milk in the sky. They didn't know what what that band was, so they named it for what it looked like, uh, not necessarily what it actually is, but the name stuck. And we currently have that name for what we call the Milky Way Galaxy. Now, just to explain a few terms, just so we're all on the same page, um, the, the Earth is a planet. Planets go around stars. We have one star in our solar system, Stars make energy, planets just reflect light from their stars. Our one star is called the sun. We have some planets, we have moons, asteroids, comets in our solar system. It's a pretty dynamic place. Our solar system is part of a much larger collection of stars and stuff called the Milky Way galaxy. But one thing you can't really tell when you're looking at this image is what is the shape of our Milky Way galaxy. It looks kind of flat and pancakey y here. Um, it, it doesn't look like a pancake. You're probably going late, but it looks like a rainbow, um, uh, that curved shape. That's because you're looking at a really, really wide image. So if you saw this in the real sky, there'd be uh, the Milky Way stretching in a band up above your head. But what does our Milky Way look like? If you were to get outside of it, it would look something like this. And this is an artist's rendition. This is not a real image. We can't get far enough away from our solar system uh, to, to take a direct picture of what the Milky Way looks like. But when we map out the stars uh, and other, other big clouds of stuff out there, this is the shape that is suggested to us from, from the mapping of, of all that stuff. Um, so we're pretty confident that we've got the shape of our galaxy correct. And if you're wondering where we are, we are approximately there. So if you can see my arrow, you can see where that circle is for the sun. Our sun is not visible in, in this drawing. Um, this drawing is much, much, we're much too far away from where our sun would be in order to see an individual star like our sun but our, our galaxy is a pinwheel shape and it's kind of, um, kind of elongated in the middle. Uh, we call it a bar just because that's what it looks like. Um, so if you were to put a name to this shape, it is called a barred spiral. Um, and that makes sense. That's exactly what, what, uh, what that, that appears to be. Now, if you take a look at this drawing, you can see there are a bunch of pink things. Those pink things are big, giant gas clouds, glowing gas. Um, they're, they're, they're basically, it's, it's um, the gas is being heated enough that it glows. 
and the gas is mostly hydrogen. And when hydrogen glows, it glows mostly pink. And so that's why you see big expanses of glowing pink. Um, but what is happening in those gas clouds is stars are forming. Stars form in big groups in big giant gas clouds. And so here is an example of, of a gas cloud. Yes, this is real. No, this is not a painting. Um, this, this really is a real thing out there in, in the real uh, Milky Way galaxy. And stars form in groups of hundreds, if not thousands of stars. And uh, after they form, they stick around for a little while. And then over time, they start to separate from each other. Um, our sun likely formed in a big group just like this. And it's, it's really interesting to see these, these stars. These are very young stars. How do I know that? Um, well, if they've still got the gas and dust around them, they've got to be pretty young. Um, also, look at the color. The color is kind of a blue-white color. These are hot stars. These are young stars. These are stars that formed only a few million years ago. Yes, I know that's a long time. It's a long time for people. It's not a long time for stars. Now, when we look back at our, at our Orion constellation, here is Betelgeuse again, here's Rigel. Um, so if you're wondering what part of Orion this is, the two stars here form his shoulders. This is his head. This is his belt. This is his sword that he's carrying. And there is one knee and there's another knee, but this is much more, uh, there's, there's a lot more going on in this picture than that first uh, image that I showed you of Orion. Um, if you take a really deep look and really map the gas and the dust around these stars, this is what it really looks like. Now we're going to take a focused look, sorry, pun intended, at, um, at this, uh, area of, of glowing gas right here. When we take a close look at that, it's this. This is called the Orion Nebula. The word nebula just basically means cloud or fuzzy thing. Uh, when astronomers were looking at some of these objects through their telescopes uh, a couple hundred years ago, they didn't know what these things were. Um, so they basically attached the word nebula to anything fuzzy. This was the fuzzy thing in the direction of the constellation Orion. So it is the Orion Nebula. There, the word nebula um, is also attached to different things. And so you'll see the same word used to represent different types of objects. In astronomy, we love confusing you. I said that before. And in this case, it's, it will name stuff the name won't turn out to be as descriptive as it should be, but then we don't go back and change the name. So anyway, that's that's a confusing thing where, where you go, wait, but this nebula is this type of thing and this other nebula is a different type of thing. And so, yeah, that's just the way it is. This is a region where stars are forming. They're, they're, they've formed in the center of the nebula right here. There are four really, really bright stars and they are the ones primarily lighting up this gas. Now there are other stars in this image that aren't quite as visible. And when say the Hubble Space Telescope takes a look at some of those stars, uh, if you take a close up look, you see that, well, you can kind of tell there's a star there, but there's some dark stuff around the stars and that is dust. Stars form in a big cloud of gas and dust and there's usually stuff forming uh, stuff around where the star is as well. So the star forms, and then from the cloud of dusty stuff that's left over, planets can form from that disk of dusty stuff. And so these are stars that have formed that have a dusty disk around them that might be in the first, in the very first stages of forming planets. Probably nothing even close to planet sized uh, in these disks but you're looking at what, a, what an infant solar system looks like before planets have even formed. 
we have been able to see planets around other stars. So some stars are farther along in the process of formation and their planets have formed. And we have discovered a number of planets around other stars. So our sun has eight or nine planets around it. I say nine. Yes, Pluto is a planet. I think that that uh, planet list should probably be a little longer. Um, but whatever number that you want to that you want to say, that's totally fine. Um, but we found planets around a lot of other stars, namely. Uh, I just did this screenshot right before we started the program. So I signed on with Jody and I went, oh, that's right. I need to go take a screenshot of this particular website and see what is the number of planets that have been found around other stars. This was just, this page was just updated today. And we have found 4,566 planets around 3,385 stars. If you take a look, we've got that number of stars hosting that number of planets. Well, that tells you that so far, the average number of planets around every single star that we're able to, to find them is, over, is more than one. So every star out there on average has at least one planet, if not more. And this middle number is the number of candidates of uh, the data suggests that there are, are more planets, but we have to follow up through other telescopes and other studies to be able to confirm those. So that is almost 8,000 planets. So add somewhere around, well, not all of these are gonna turn out to be planets. Some, some are just gonna be anomalies in the data. Let's just say it's 7,000 more add 7,000 more to this number here and you're gonna get over 11,000 planets. That's a lot of planets. Um, and so we think there are millions, if not billions of planets, possibly even into the trillions of planets in our Milky Way galaxy. Some of them are really weird. If you take a look, some are um, as big as Jupiter or bigger and some are the size of Earth or even a little smaller. There are undoubtedly planets smaller than Earth. It's just that the bigger they are, the easier, the easier they are to find. The smaller they are, the harder they are to find. So the first planets that we were able to find were big ones. And so this, this is an artist's rendition of the first planet that was found and announced in 1995. And then this one right here, is approximately Earth-sized. I think that one is just slightly um, larger, or slightly, just a tiny bit larger than, uh, than Earth. But these Jupiter-sized planets uh, aren't necessarily completely like Jupiter. Some of these are really, really close to their home stars. We call them hot Jupiters. Think of these planets as being extraordinarily hot and they orbit their stars in just a few days. I'll put that into perspective. This, this planet right here that you're looking at, the big one, it orbits its host star in about four days. So today is Thursday. So Friday night, Saturday night, Sunday night, Monday night. Monday night, if you sit back and think, you go, oh, 51 Pegasi B has gone around its star once. Not rotated once, it's year last four Earth days. That's a pretty fast moving planet. That planet is really close to its star. In a few cases, we've been able to map some clouds uh, of some of these planets. And so this is an artist's rendition of this planet that is a, a bit bigger than Jupiter. Um, so we can tell that there are clouds in the atmospheres. Well, first off, we can discover planets. Secondly, we can tell that some of these planets have air. Thirdly, we can tell that a handful of these planets have clouds in their air. How's that for progress in the last 26 years? That's, that's quite a bit of progress. This planet, it's artist's rendition of, of the rings around this planet. This ring system is 200 times larger than that of Saturn. So you imagine what that looks like up close. This is what uh, a science artist has, has 
figured out that what this may look like. Um, so uh, it would be pretty spectacular to see this planet up close. This planet is called WASP-79b. No, they don't all have cutesy names. Maybe someday they'll all have names, but WASP-79, or well, WASP is the name of the telescope system that did the study. 79 is the 79th star in the study. B is the first planet that was found. So WASP-79b, today's forecast on this particular planet is a steamy 3000 degrees, humid, scattered clouds, yellow skies, and iron rain. This is not like Earth. <laughs> this is a very nasty place, but it is so different from, from our particular planet. This one is called a super puff. It's, it sounds like a breakfast cereal. It's not. It's a nickname for a very rare type of, of planet that has the density of cotton candy. Nothing like this exists in our solar system. Um, these, these very low density planets, the air is going to evaporate into space over time. Um, and in about a billion years, this planet will look like a smaller, hotter version of Neptune. Um, so anyway, we get to see these planets early on in, uh, in their history. Um, so it's, it's pretty interesting that, that we're finding stuff that's kind of like stuff we have in our solar system. And we're finding a lot of stuff that isn't like anything we have in our solar system. We don't have planets that, have, that are the density of cotton candy. I didn't say they were made of cotton candy. Density of cotton candy. Um, so anyway, we've got a planetary system that has seven planets in it. So these planets are about the size of Earth or slightly smaller. So about the size of Earth, slightly bigger, slightly smaller. Um, and so uh, this is called the TRAPPIST-1 system. TRAPPIST refers to the telescope system. One refers to the first star that was studied. And this planet or this uh, star has seven, at least seven planets around it. This particular planet um, is a really, a really weird one. Uh, the star that this planet orbits has three planets total. The closest one is rocky. Great, our, our Earth is rocky, but this, that's where the similarities end. Um, the, the side facing the sun for this planet is at about 4,000 degrees. It's probably a molten surface, but what it actually looks like, we have no idea because 4,000 degrees is higher than any temperature where scientists on Earth have made lava in the lab. We've been able to make lava in a lab. You melt rock, see what happens. But the temperature that we've been able to do that at is lower than 4,000 degrees. We have no idea what 4,000 degree lava looks like. So again, a really strange planet with lava probably covering its entire surface. Here's another one of those clouds of gas and dust. Um, and one thing that you've got in this, uh, in this cloud is, you'll have to take my word for it, this isn't a close-up picture over here, but you've got stars that are young over here. Again, take my word for it. Um, but there's a star over here that is this one right here. This star is actually reaching the end of its lifetime, somewhere near the end. And it is violently puffing off itself into space. It's, it's got bubbles of stuff that have come off of this star um, and it's blowing parts of itself off into space. But there is a much more violent thing that happens with stars. We call it a supernova. And that's when a star explodes. Um, this will not happen to our sun. Our sun is not big enough to explode, um, but we have seen what happens when stars explode. And basically they obliterate themselves. They, they, they blow uh, what's left off into space. And um, so this is what's left of a star that exploded 
the explosion, the, the bright light in the sky was seen on Earth about 340 years ago. Uh, mm -hmm. Scientists didn't know what that was. They just saw a bright light in the sky and went, oh, something new, Nova, new. And so uh, then later we needed a better word to describe an actual explosion of a star. That's where the word supernova comes from, super new. In this case, super old or super end. Um, this is not a star, a new star. This is a star that is uh, that has reached the end of its lifetime. This is called the Crab Nebula. The um, uh, by the way, if you're trying to find an image of a crab in there, don't. Um, it's it's not that it looks like a crab. It's that the Latin word for crab is cancer. So if you're wondering cancer the crab, you're saying crab the crab. Um, Leo the lion, Leo is lion. It's, it's or uh, um, uh, Taurus the bull, you're saying bull the bull. So the, you have the Latin word of the constellation and then the English word afterwards. So cancer, cancer actually came about from people looking at cancer tumors in the human body, probably after someone died. They had no idea what, what a cancer tumor was, but a lot of them looked spiky and almost uh, uh, with, with uh, um, kind of looking spiky or, or um, I'm trying to think of a word. They look like this. Basically, they look like they have stuff coming, coming off of them and going around and all that. So they, give, they gave this name cancer to crabs. Crabs look like they have spiky things and stuff coming off of them. And so that's where the word cancer comes from in terms of uh, the constellation. And then this is called the crab nebula. You could call it the cancer nebula um, because people thought it looked like a cancer tumor. Kind of weird, right? Sometimes we get the names of some of this stuff. Is, is convoluted and strange. Um, but anyway, this, uh, the, the nova, the new light in the sky for this one was seen on earth almost a thousand years ago. And in the, in the intervening thousand years, the material that was the star is expanding outward. And we've been able to take various pictures, put them together over time, and you can see some of the expansion of of, uh, of this nebula. Now the next slide, I hope it comes through on your end okay. It'll kind of depend on your internet speed. So I apologize, there's no way that I have to slow this down. Um, so anyway, but I hope you're seeing that you can see the actual cloud of stuff expands. And so the first image of this was, was taken probably over a hundred years ago. Um, and so intervening uh, or in, uh, other pictures have been uh, layered on on top of that. So I showed you what happened with a star that the explosion, the bright light was seen on earth uh, about 300 years ago. And then one that was seen on earth about a thousand years ago. And then this one, if you were in the Southern hemisphere 1700 years ago, you would have seen this. Um, what was going on on earth 1700 years ago? Uh, at that point, the Roman empire was starting to crumble, but the bright light from this one in the sky could only have been seen in the Southern hemisphere. No record exists that we have found of the bright light that was seen in the sky. Nobody in the Southern hemisphere, as far as we know, wrote down an observation or, or, or pictured it in any way. But you may be wondering, how do we know how old a cloud is? How does a cloud tell us how old it is? Well, the clue was in the last, uh, the last uh, animation. You take pictures a certain number of years apart and you see how far the cloud has expanded. You then roll back the movie and you say, okay, for this thing to have been a star, how long would it take to bring all that stuff together if we roll back the, uh, uh, the, the time. And the answer for this one is 1700 years ago. And that's when this star blew itself apart. 
Now that everything that I've shown you is stuff that's within or very near our own Milky Way galaxy. So this is one galaxy. There are others, there are a lot of others, literally hundreds of billions of others, but there's a local group of galaxies. And uh, the two main ones are called the Milky Way galaxy and the Andromeda galaxy. There's a few others that are smaller. And this local group is called the local group. Sometimes in astronomy, you wish you come up with a cute name, but for whatever reason, someone decided local group was the best name for this group of, of, uh, of galaxies. Anyway, each one of these galaxies has a, has a number of stars. Generally, the smaller ones have fewer stars. The bigger ones have, have more stars. Uh, Milky Way has somewhere around 400 billion stars. Andromeda, I think, has, has a little bit more than that, somewhere like that. But when we look around the sky and we look at some of the other galaxies elsewhere, we see there are different shapes. Milky Way and Andromeda are spirals. This one is called elliptical. Elliptical just means something kind of round. It could be oval shaped, it could be round shaped, it could be football shaped, but they're just essentially round galaxies. The only thing is you're, you're far enough away from this galaxy that all the individual stars just sort of fuzz together. This is not one star. This is literally billions of stars that are close enough together that they just sort of fuzz together. And so you can't see the individual stars that make up this galaxy. Uh, but this is an elliptical one. Here's one that's a little bit squashed, but take a look all around it. Don't forget to look all around. All these fuzzy things are other galaxies. Now, one thing that it's kind of hard to tell just from looking at a picture is how far away are all these? Just like the stars are at different distances, di distances. the galaxies are at different distances. Um, so for example, this one down here at the bottom, that spiral one, it could be really big and a lot farther away than, than the main one in the picture, or it could be smaller and closer. We'd have to do other analyses to figure out how far away that, that galaxy is, but we can do that with the rest of them. But you can kind of say, sort of, that for the, the ones that are really small, they're probably pretty far away. And the bigger ones are probably closer. So now you're able to just glance at a picture kind of and just go, huh, I sort of get a sense at what might be closer and what might be farther. Here's another one, another group. Galaxies come in groups. So here you're seeing, there's a spiral one here, another one here. Here's, a, here's an elliptical one here and here, another kind of spirally one here. But most of the other things in this picture are other galaxies. Galaxies also come in no shape. We call those, uh, they're basically uh, irregular. Uh, there's, there's no discernible actual shape to these. Um, so we can see a few of them out there. They look nice, but no, no pattern to any of these. Pretty cool pictures, right? I love the pictures. Anyway, this is another spiral one. It's called the Whirlpool Galaxy. It's one of the few that is actually named for what it really does look like. A lot of stuff in astronomy doesn't look like what it's named for. Here's another spiral. Just imagine this is made of individual stars, literally a hundred billion or more stars. But again, we're so far away from this object that you can't see the individual stars. So they just all kind of look fuzzed together. Here's another spiral. So you can see even among the spirals, the shape can change. Sometimes our orientation is different. So this is a spiral that instead of looking uh, a little more face on, this is looking a little more edge on. So it's not squished. It's that you're seeing it more from the edge than from the top. So that's an example there of one that's more edge on. And there's one, this is called the Sombrero Galaxy. I kind of don't know why. It doesn't really, to me anyway, it doesn't really look like a sombrero. I don't know what it looks like, but I don't know if I would have given it that name. But anyway, this is also seen more, almost 
almost uh, purely edge on. Now, sometimes these galaxies run into each other. Now this, whoops, Let's see, is that gonna play for me? There we go. This is an animation of what is gonna happen to the Milky Way galaxy in a few billion years. We are on a collision course with, whoops, with the Andromeda galaxy. And so in a few billion years, the Andromeda galaxy is gonna make kind of a glancing pass at the Milky Way. Do not worry. There will be no harm that will come to just about anything due to this galactic collision. These collisions happen all the time. Notice the time, the amount of time it, it takes for this to happen. We're already 4 billion years into the future. And, but notice what happens. They get all stretched and warped. And, and from two spirals, you end up with one elliptical. So that's how you get round galaxies. You get two of them that run into each other and they make a round one. So that's, that's kind of cool that we're able to figure that out, especially something that now look, it's over 7 billion years in the future. So this will take a really long time. If you're wondering why I said, don't worry, because you look, I'm like, oh my God, galaxies running into each other. Stars are so far apart. Space is so empty that all the stars pretty much will just slide right past each other. So that's why there's, there's a lot of space in space. And again, here's another round one. And this one likely used to be two galaxies and ended up as one big one. Now this is a special one. This is called M87. Um, it was a galaxy that uh, we pointed some telescopes at it a few years ago, and we were able to photograph the area around the very center of this galaxy. What is in the center of this galaxy, but a very, very large black hole. And a black hole is an area that has lots and lots of mass in a really small space. This is an artist's rendition of a black hole. By the way, if you're thinking to yourself, that doesn't look like a hole, you're right. The name black hole was never meant to convey what it looks like. The name black hole came from a comparison to a notorious jail in, I believe it was Calcutta, India, the, the, the black hole prison there. It got the term black hole because people were said to go in and never come out. So that's what happens with a black hole in space. It has enough gravity because of all that mass that if you got really close to it, you would fall in and you would never be able to get out. So again, it's a, it's a cool name. It gets people's attention, but don't think that it, it, it conveys what it looks like. It conveys what it does. It conveys that, that gravity, if you get close enough to one of these things, gravity will pull you in. Now, I, I said this was an artist's rendition. And um, by the way, this area right here, it looks like a sphere, like a solid ball. It's not. That's called the event horizon. That's the point at which light can't escape from this object. That uh, the gravity is so strong that light can't even escape from it. Um, so it's not a solid thing. Uh, right there where you see that, it's just that light is not able to come out uh, from that point. So absence of light is black. And so that's why it, it's, it gets that name black. But I, I mentioned there's a picture and this is the picture. This is the area right around the black hole in the center of the M87 galaxy. This is a disk of stuff going really fast. It's really hot. It's traveling in a clockwise direction. And the area of the black hole itself, the event horizon is in the very middle of this. We can't see it in the picture, um, but this is the area right around that black hole. So pretty awesome that we can get that picture. Galaxies come in groups. I mentioned the local group of about 20. They come in clusters 
of hundreds, if not thousands of galaxies. This is uh, one cluster called the Fornax cluster. Fornax just refers to the name of the constellation in, in the direction that these galaxies are. This one is called the Hercules cluster. And it's just astonishing when you look at this picture, almost everything in this picture is a galaxy containing lots and lots of individual stars. There's a handful of, of individual stars in this picture. Those are stars within our own Milky Way galaxy. We have to look past them like spots on the kitchen window. You have to look past them in order to see the stuff behind, beyond. So the stars, the individual stars are in our Milky Way and you're looking at lots of galaxies made up of individual stars that you can't see because we're, we're that far away from them, but you can definitely see their light. And then finally, a really deep look. What is in the farthest reaches of the universe? Well, in the mid to latter 1990s, um, the Hubble Space Telescope was pointed at a spot in the sky where we had never seen anything before. And basically they, they, they told Hubble to basically stare at this spot in the sky for, it was something like four days worth of time, four or five days worth of time. Weren't sure if they were gonna photo, be able to photograph anything. Didn't know if there was anything in that spot in the sky, but this is the picture that they got. What they got is called the Hubble Deep Field. And it consists of about 3000 galaxies in an area of the sky um, that if you take a, uh, a dime and hold it out at arm's length and you look at President Roosevelt's eyeball, that is the area on the sky that, that this image takes up. So there's a lot of galaxies in that picture, plus a handful of individual stars. Again, spots on the window in our own Milky Way that we're looking beyond to see. This is another one uh, called the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. And this is an image of about 10,000 galaxies. Almost everything in this picture is another galaxy. People ask me all the time, do I think there's life elsewhere in the universe? I say, do the math. Literally hundreds of billions of galaxies in the universe containing hundreds of billions of stars, each star containing potentially one or more planets. There's got to be something else out there. There has to be. I don't know where, but when you take a look, it's pretty intriguing to think about. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing. And I think there were some notes in the chat. I'm going to see. Okay. So, uh, Marianne asks, excellent question, Marianne. Where did the gases come from in terms of those big clouds, right? Uh, and why don't they just dissipate in space? The answer is they do dissipate in space. And so over time, they dissipate. So they, if there's nothing there to act on them, over time, the gas will just disperse. Every once in a while, you have this cloud and maybe a star will pass by and the gravity of that star will start to cause the cloud to spin. As it spins, it, gets, it might get more compact, it might flatten. And so you, you then can get maybe some stars forming from that rotating cloud. But where does the cloud even come from to begin with? From expired stars. So it's a big giant cycle. The first stars formed. They exploded. Gas was blown out into the universe. More stars started forming from the, the leftovers. They lived a while. They blew up. More gas and stuff was out there in the, in the universe. And this cycle keeps repeating. But eventually that cycle kind of slows down. You're right. This stuff will disperse and it won't be able to be compacted enough uh, to make new stars. And so there is an eventual end to all that, but that's exactly the cycle that keeps happening. So great question. Um, so the, where the gases come from, 
prior stars is, is basically where those gases come from. Why are they called exoplanets? What's the meaning? Exoplanet means external. Planets external to our solar system. Planets not in our own solar system. So exo just means elsewhere, essentially. So uh, that's, that's the meaning of that word. What is my definition of a galaxy? The definition of a galaxy is a, an object containing at least 10,000 stars, if not maybe even a few more. Um, anything less than that, and it's just a big cloud of gas and dust that contains a lot of stars. Um, at least 10,000 stars, if not more, um, is, is a galaxy. And so you can have little ones, you can have medium-sized ones, you can have really big ones. So it's, it's just a giant collection of stars and their planets and gas and dust and stuff. Um, are there any square or square-ish galaxies? No, there are not. That's because square doesn't really exist very easily in, in the universe. Um, if you have something that's big enough, gravity is going to pull whatever that is into a round shape. Um, where the, those spirals, where those come from, and I'm a little fuzzy, oh, sorry, pun not intended. I'm a little fuzzy on the formation of spirals, um, but I know it has to do with gravity and, oh, you'll have to look up, look up formation of spirals and, and we'll, we'll, we'll all learn together as to uh, where those come from. But um, the, the, upshot of it is if you have something big enough, gravity is essentially going to pull it into a round shape. And then when it starts to dissipate like a big cloud or something, it's just going to kind of randomly go out. So no, the, the only things that exist in the universe that are square are crystals. Crystals would be a regular pattern. So you've got um, different kinds of minerals make different shapes of crystals. And so I can think of some crystals are square shaped, like pyrite, that sort of stuff. So that's, that's where you might, might find something square, but no square galaxies, just round ones and spiral ones and no shape ones. Uh, Jody asks, can I tell you about the development of the Hubble telescope? Yes. So very short version of, a, of more about 50 years worth of, of development. So the Hubble Space Telescope was approved in the early 70s. Sorry, I should back up. The Hubble Space Telescope, the concept of a space telescope was thought of in the 40s, um, started to be talked about in the 50s and 60s, approved as the large space telescope in the early 70s, designed in the mid to latter 70s, built in the latter 70s to early 80s, launched in 1990, and it's been taking pictures of stuff ever since. And so what's also really interesting to know is that the development of the follow-on telescope to Hubble started before Hubble even got off the ground. And that was in the late 80s and design really started happening in earnest in 1995-96. And that is now called the James Webb Space Telescope and launch of that telescope is slated to happen um, on December 18th. After 25 years of development of that telescope, it will finally launch on December 18th. So what we can do, Jody, if you want, because I don't think we have another program slated yet on the calendar. No, but let's I always some, schedule one right after the- <laughs> yeah, Let's make sure that thing successfully gets off the ground because it is not a trivial thing. Let's make sure it, it works, it gets into space, the rocket doesn't blow up, something doesn't happen crazy. And then hopefully after the first of the year, um, we may have a better sense of whether this is gonna work or not. So I've got a talk all ready to go <laughs> about that one. Um, I, it's almost a little feeling a little jinxy if I if I say, yeah, we should schedule it right now. Like, okay. then, then something will happen. <laughs> So is there is there a space race with with the technology? Is there is there something like competitive going on across the globe of people trying to get more and more uh, advanced, or is it more of a uh, community effort? And and who worked on Hubble? 
Um, NASA yeah. and the European Space Agency primarily. Thank you. Uh, James Webb is NASA, the European Space Agency, and there's some other countries as well, and it will involve thousands of scientists all over the entire planet to, to get the science data from that. But 1,200 people basically built the, the James Webb Space Telescope. Um, is it competitive? Yes. Um, I'll... Unfortunately, okay, this is Michelle speaking, Michelle, and not necessarily uh, the opinion of her employer, this is my own opinion, that I don't think it needs to be as competitive. There are certain, there's, there's a particular country that we are not allowed to work with, at least NASA is not allowed to work with China by governmental decree, Congress. So, it is kind of competitive, but we work with just about everybody else. India, United Arab Emirates, Europe, Russia, Japan. A lot of other countries uh, want to put stuff up into space. They just don't have the capability. So they can build it, we can launch it and, and stuff like that happens. And then you've got the private companies, SpaceX, Boeing, Blue Origin, um, uh, Virgin Galactic, all, all that kind of stuff. So there's there's that kind of competition as well for space tourism. Um, so I think these days it's more along the lines of, do you keep the, the, the drive going to be the first to do something? There's some prestige still in, in doing that kind of stuff. Oh, you're the first to land on X. You're the first to send up whatever. Um, so there's still, there's always going to be some of that, no matter what. So anyway, I say there's plenty of room in the universe for all of us. The universe is a really big place. So it doesn't have to be so competitive if you ask me, but when, but when you throw in those private companies, yeah, they're going to be, they're going to be a little territorial sometimes. <laughs> So anyway, again, Michelle's opinion, not necessarily the others. Being a kid from the 70s, you know, I missed the, the landing. Oh, I feel like a baby now. I mean, you're, you're a baby. I am. <laughs> yeah, I was I was two months old for the for the oh, final Apollo in. Apollo <laughs> mission. So I I. I was around, I just, I, if I saw it, I had no idea what I was looking at, but um, yeah, I was more the child of the space shuttle. So have kind of the nostalgic uh, uh, twinges for that program. Um, and these days, a lot of it, kids, when they're growing up, they're wanting to work for SpaceX. That is like the thing right now. Um, and it's really interesting that I don't consider it a mere coincidence that people are really interested in space. Uh, you've got a lot of movies that have come out. Uh, the Martian, Interstellar, Gravity, um, and there's others. Those are popular. Can we say the Big Bang Theory TV show was on for 10 plus years? Extraordinarily useful, I think, to I think to kind of show that nerd is cool. Who knew that I was cool? Um, <laughs> apparently, I've been cool my entire life. <laughs> so, um, uh, but it, it sh I think that TV show kind of helped show some kids at least a few hey there's other people out there like you and it's okay to be to be to be interested in this stuff um and so you're seeing an explosion of interest uh for engineers and people wanting to work for these cutting edge companies so pretty interesting i have this is marianne i have yeah. a couple more questions sure so if the gases dissipate so when you see the pillars, the pic I love the picture pillars of creation. That yep. is just so spectacular. Yep. 
are you saying that that was just a specific moment in time and if they took a picture now it would look completely different or when you say they dissipate over time like, are we talking billions and billions of years? No. So that particular picture, um, hang on, for those who might not be aware of that one. So give me just a second and I will find that picture real quick as I'm talking. Let's see if I can type and talk at the same time. Um, this is how Michelle totally rules, by the way. Yeah. You can just like pull it up because I know you've got like your stash, your cache of files. Well, what's really uh, kind of cool, uh, uh, the one neat thing that came out of the pandemic is to be able to do these programs remotely. And it allows me to, to do some stuff like this. It's a little harder sometimes to do it when you're there in person, because depending on the library, you may or may not have internet access. Right. And so um, so yeah, this kind of stuff, I go, oh yeah, I can bring that up, no problem. So this is um, the Pillars of Creation image. Um, so this object is far enough away that if you were to, so this is the, the light as it came to us over some number of thousands of years. In the case of this, it probably doesn't look like this right now. If you were to go to it, if you could magically snap your fingers and teleport directly to this thing, it probably wouldn't look like this because it will have dissipated because what you can't see up above the, the edge of the picture, there's, a, there's at least one hot, hot star um, up there and that is what's blowing away the dust and stuff. Okay. And so in some number of thousand years, it will have probably eroded that gas away and just kind of blew it off into, into the nearby area. So yeah, in that case, it probably doesn't look like that. Bad, okay. Yeah. Okay, then my other question, this is about um, the collision of the galaxies of, of Andromeda yes. and the Milky yes. Way. So the, theoretically, if something else in the local area exploded, could that change the, the gravitational tra trajectory? No. Nope. So that's nope. definitely going to happen. Definitely going to happen. Okay. You would need something the size of Milky Way or Andromeda nearby to cause that to not happen as much or, or happen okay. differently. Okay. Um, so if you're talking a teeny weeny star compared to a big gigantic galaxy, yeah, just supernova, okay. whatever, would, wouldn't make a difference. Okay. Not at all. Cool. Good questions. I love your you, questions, Marianne. You're interested in this stuff. <laughs> I can tell. Yeah, yeah. I, you were right. The pictures were spectacular. Like I said, just put me on mute. Just let the let the pictures just, just fly by. And so <laughs> I tell you that at the end. <laughs> yeah. All right. So before we go, Michelle, just yeah. give us an, an idea of what a day at the Adler is like for you. What do you do? Well, <laughs> if it's been a day in, since March 13th of 2020, uh, this is the Adler Planetarium <laughs> for me. So oops, I just, and my chair just hit my desk. Um, uh, so uh, in non-pandemic times, <laughs> when, when we're not all working from home, um, Gosh, my, my days are wildly varied and different. So I could, we could be taking a telescope out to a park in Chicago at night and setting it up for an hour or two and anyone walking by can take a look. That's our, that's our outreach program called Scopes in the City. Um, we might be planning to do uh, an observing event in our observatory where we just say, hey, come on down, take a look through the telescope. Um, I could be working on an exhibit. Maybe there's an exhibit that has some night sky component or something to do with telescopes or just something in a, in a topic that I'm really interested in, like the solar system or something like that. Uh, and so maybe we have meetings to, uh, to chat about exhibits or shows or, or something like that. It, it's crazy different one, one day to the next. Although the work from home version is a little more steady in terms of kind of the same yeah. thing. I get up, I come in here, <laughs> check my email, do some stuff, might have some online meetings, um, but we're, we're, the staff is being allowed to go back more regularly into the building starting Monday. 
and uh, we will fully reopen to the public on March 4th. So we're gonna slowly go back. We're not all going back all at the same time, just cause that would be pretty taxing on, uh, on our operations department to do that. Um, but we're gonna be starting to staff back up um, in a few weeks. So we're gonna start that process. So that's great news. Yes. Okay, yes. Michelle, I have another, well, I have a suggestion. Yes. Have, have you or the planetarium ever considered doing like a, a, a night trip? Because I would love to go to some of the dark sky places, but I'm not going to go by myself. I mean, I'm not going to be in some park at three o'clock in the morning all alone. Right, right. We've, we've done it with our teens. We have some teens that um, do programs with us and some of our teen program staff have taken some of the teens to the Indiana Dunes and uh -huh. also to the Middle Fork River Forest Preserve outside of Champaign. Right. So we've done that with teens. We haven't done it in a really long time with adults. Um, we had a travel program years ago and the person who ran it uh, retired. And so it was kind of hard to keep that going. Mm. Um, I think it's kind of on people's uh, general radar. I don't know when or if it could come back. Um, but I'll keep that in mind. That's, it might be something that we might be able to do in the future. We've done eclipse trips. Mm -hmm. um, nothing nothing te technically night sky trips. I don't think we've done that with adults uh, specifically, but I don't know. That's a, that's I would sign idea. up for that in a heartbeat. You know, where would be a really great place to go besides Middle Fork River is Galena. Oh. I'm always impressed with how dark it is out in the Galena area. Um, and it's just a beautiful part of our state. Mm -hmm. Our state is not all cord fields. <laughs> it's not all flat. <laughs> so, but what, yeah, go ahead. But Galena and Middle Fork would be, and the dunes, I mean, they would be close enough to do as a uh -huh. one night bus trip, yeah. as opposed to like the upper peninsula of Michigan. I mean, that's right. a little, you know, that's you. A you almost have to make that a, yeah that's almost a two day the two night trip but yeah the i think the 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 farthest could be like Mackinac. i've done a Mackinac drive in about seven hours i think yeah yeah so door county door yeah. county is only about four hours away and it's uh pretty decent skies up there like washington island mm -hmm. uh rock island up there i don't know you're kind of got me uh, kind of got me thinking Marianne. We need to get past this pandemic first. Yeah, no kidding. No kidding. <laughs> then we can think about trips. Um, but I don't know. I mean, you know what? I have an ongoing wish list that my boss is probably going, oh man, cha-ching. Um, mm -hmm. But every time I add something to it, but um, I, just, uh, I just wrote that down. So good hmm, hmm, for a few years from now. Uh, I have a question. Now, what is the next major astro event that we are looking at? Eclipses are coming. Yes. So um, the next major one is a lunar eclipse a week from Friday. A week from, yeah. So a week from, a week from tomorrow. So um, it starts, it? it starts at about 120 in the morning. And it's, a, it's technically a partial, but it's almost full, meaning the moon is going to slide into the darkest part of the Earth's shadow, but just a little sliver of it, maybe 5% of it won't be within that dark part. I have no idea what this one is going to look like. Is it going to be red? Is it going to be gray? Is it going to be orange, brown? I don't know. I, I don't know what color this is going to be. So um, it'll last for a little over three hours. So from about say 1.30 to about 4.30-ish, somewhere in there. Um, so that's the next major eclipse. Um, then we've got the two solar eclipses coming up in 2023 and 2024. So October 14th of 2023, uh, it's a Saturday. Uh, from the Chicago area, 43% of the sun will be covered by the moon. April 8th, 2024, 94% of the sun will be covered by the moon as seen from the Chicago area. And the path of totality will run through Southern Illinois and up into Indianapolis. 
So totality won't be that far of a drive away. Uh, you, just need, you just need clear skies for it. I mean, the eclipse is going to happen no matter what. Whether or not we'll see it is, is another question. Because um, it's April. It could be 70. It could snow sideways. So i um, trying to think if there's anything else. There's the lunar eclipse in a week. There's a total lunar eclipse May 15th of next year. And then another one in November of next year. So we've got this partial two totals next year. Uh, the two eclipses, 2023, 2024. That's kind of the major stuff coming up. Uh, and, and we're heading towards solar maximum. So possibly more opportunities to see auroras um, in our area as we get toward that in about 2024-ish. So is that there something you could do? Oh, sorry, is that something you could do a program on also on the on the auroras? Um, I could, I never have, but I could, that's a great, that's a great That'd topic idea. I'm always looking for topic ideas. Yeah. Especially since we're coming up on solar maximum, that's a good reason to do yeah. it. Yeah. Astroeducator.com, everybody. Astroeducator.com. That's me. Okay. Yes. Although I listed the title of this program incorrectly on my website. I had it, like I told Jody, I had it right in my calendar, but. We still I just had, I just had COVID brain, I guess. So. <laughs> You're a pleasure to have as always. Thank you. Thank you for your mind and your expertise. Thank you. Thank you for being You're such a great always. audience. Thank you, Marianne. Thank everybody. Thank you, everybody else. Yeah, thanks, Hope to everyone. see you all in person someday soon. Likewise. You definitely surpassed the hype. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, stay safe, everyone. Be well. And uh, we will be together soon, uh, either virtually or in person. And uh, I'll talk to Jody about getting another one on the calendar, hopefully the James Webb telescope. And then I'm going to think about doing an Aurora's program. So I'm going to start Go thinking ahead. about putting that together. Good idea. Perfect.